Okay, so hello, hello everybody. Welcome to the International Open Seminar on Semiotics, a tribute to John Dilley on the 50th anniversary of his passing. So this is a collaborative international open scientific initiative and celebration that connects a network of dozens of personalities and organizations coming from various environments and with different profiles, all working in unison towards the advancements and propagation of semiotic studies. So today we are very glad to have here this presentation entitled The Contested Relation to Reality of the Creative Treatment of Actuality by Dr. Fernando Andasht. So I'm very glad to receive Dr. Andasht here and also Dr. Luis de Miranda. He will be the commentator of today's presentation. So I would like to start by introducing Dr. Andasht. He holds a doctor in philosophy from the University of Bergen in Norway and a PhD in communication and information from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. He is a full professor at the Department of Theory of Communication the Faculty of Information and Communication, University of the Republica, Montevideo, in Uruguay. He is a researcher of the National System of Research. He was a Fulbright Scholar at the Research Center for Language and Semiotic Studies, Indiana University, and a grantee of the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung at the, sorry for my pronunciation, Albert Stelle für Semiotik. Technische Universita in Berlin. Since 2006, he is a guest professor of the graduate program in communication and languages, University to UT do, of Paraná in Brazil, and, and at the PhD program in semiotics of the National University of Cordoba in Argentina. He published 10 books and over 100 articles and chapters in his field of expertise the person semiotic analysis of the media with emphasis on the representation of mediated reality, documentary, reality television, and propaganda. So Dr. Andash, it's a great, a great pleasure, pleasure and a honor to have you here and you can start the presentation. Welcome. Dr. Andash, you are, we cannot hear you. You are, Microphone. Yeah, muting is the, is the mal du siècle. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you both uh, William and Robert for all the previous uh, information and obviously for this wonderful invitation to join uh, this international seminar in the memory of John Dilley. And I would like to begin with a very short, brief recollection. It was the year of 1996. I was attending the um, Latin American Congress of Semiotic in Sao Paulo, in the PUCI, the Pontificia Universidad Católica in Sao Paulo, under the guidance of the wonderful uh, Lucia Santaella, who is still a, a force of nature in matter semiotic. And uh, I met in the flesh the great John Dilly, and I asked him, I was, uh, I've been worried, uh, concerned for some time with the notion of ground, which in my, my mind appears in very few places in Persis' writings, particularly in volume 2, 228, when he defines the sign, right? As something uh, that stands in place of the object, not from every aspect, but from a certain uh, ground. And uh, he kept holding and says, oh, I will talk to you later. And he was busy always and so on. And it's very funny, uh, it comes, my anecdote comes to an end, but I think it shows the kind of person, the kind of uh, scholar and, and passionate uh, student of uh, semiotic and philosophy that John Dilly was. We were returning from the fiesta, from the wonderful celebration to end this Sao Paulo uh, Latin American Semiotic Congress. And it was very late, we had drunk obviously, like we have to do in those wonderful festivities. And uh, he asked the person to open the bar of the hotel. We were both staying 
and he came down from his room with a huge manuscript and we sat down at say two in the morning to explain to me uh maybe it was the four ages of understanding that was coming who knows uh what the ground was for him that that i think paints this man uh, uh this his dedication right so i will try now to share but i see that i cannot so i ask robert please i'm sorry about that but this system is new to me <laughs> and uh, my presentation my powerpoint okay uh i will try to skip some of them so it's not too boring uh great robert thank you Okay, here it is. Um, first of all, uh, a word about the title. Why is it called the contested relation to reality? Because I will try to argue against what is the hegemonic or predominant position of both uh, theoreticians and documentary makers. I'm talking about people I admire, not of beginners or inept uh, filmmakers, but of the best. I will give an example of one of the these big, big um, figures in the universe of, of documentary genre, who is the late uh, Eduardo Coutinho, okay, from Sao Paulo, who made some classic work, okay, uh, until his death, unfortunately, uh, violent death in 2014. And all these people uh, say that the documentary is anything but a representation of reality. And a symptom or uh, an index of that is the mm, pervasive use of the term character. Uh, to put it in a nutshell, uh, both the people who write the theory and the people who make these wonderful documentaries, which I so much enjoy and, and watch again and again, and I've written a bit about them, uh, they will say that the persons who agree to come into uh, these naturalistic documentaries, such as the one I will show you a few minutes, of course, uh, Jogo de Sena or Edificio Master or Canzones, songs, okay, Edificio Master is the name of a building, lower middle class, middle class in Rio de Janeiro, and Jogo de Sena is difficult to translate, but it's a kind of uh, pun on the mise en scène uh, as a play with the staging, right? As a play with the staging uh, from 2007. The moment the camera goes on, the person sitting in front of the director, what, what Coutinho called the encounter, the coming face to face, right? Against this virtual thing we are having now, uh, becomes a character, personage in Portuguese, character. Okay, I'll show you some examples of that from Coutinho's poetics. He was a very reflexive uh, documentary maker. He gave some wonderful interviews, okay, the equivalent of having written about the documentary poetics. Uh, it, they will insist that it's a character, not a person. I will argue based on uh, Persian cynicism, okay, the doctrine of logical continuity and fallibilism and other ideas and particularly on john dealey's uh, description of relation i've chosen a book that is anything but basic though it's called basics of semiotics okay and, and i think it's a it's a marvelous introduction I, I have the book somewhere here uh it's a marvelous introduction to the the kernel of triadic persian semiotic uh i will try to argue that there is no such thing as a character. The person that they represent audiovisually in these fine documentaries is a person. And the phrase that follows, I quote, the creative treatment of actuality belongs to Scottish theorist and filmmaker, John Grierson, who is a kind of uh, key figure in the documentary movement, uh, born in Scotland, he ended his life uh, in Canada, okay? And I think the phrase is very ambivalent because we have actuality as what Peirce would say, existence or secondness or axiety, to quote his use of Dan Scotus' term for the here and now, what you meet, okay, in, in, uh, as a, as a res resistance or reaction of life of things. And the creative treatment, okay, is all that obviously the filmmaker brings to it by choosing the subject matter, by using editing, by using soundtrack music or not, and everything, which of course I'm not going to deny or minimize, but still, still, I think that this actuality is manages to get through, and what we see is a revelation of some marvelous aspects of the person that many times those persons who are filmed, who agree to be filmed, this is no candid camera, uh, don't even know, okay, that is in them, and that comes out in that what uh, Coutinho beautifully calls uh, the catalysis, okay? Catal the catalyst is a, a chemical agent that makes a reaction happen before that it would happen normally. 
All right. And so that will be my point. And I will be showing you a fragment, thanks to Robert and William's help, a fragment of Joe de Sena, the ending, in fact, the, clo the closing of the film, in which a character asks to go back, something extraordinary, okay? Because we have normal women, ordinary women, coming to the stage of a, a small deserted theater in Rio de Janeiro, where there's only the crew of the camera, of Coutinho, Coutinho himself, and uh, an ordinary woman telling a story. That was the request in a newspaper. If you have a story to tell and you are an adult, you see over 18 years, please uh, answer this uh, ad. And uh, the thing gets more complicated, but of this further on later. Can we go to the next, please, Robert? Okay, I go now to what I consider the kernel, okay, the heart of the semiosis view uh, from a documentary film perspective. This is my proposal to you. Uh, it all begins with an unnerving, disconcerting question of John Dilly. In this book from 1990, he asked at one point, I open a uh, quotation, in what sense is the parent of a dead child still a parent? End of quote. It's a very weird, right? Even you can say an uncanny question, a strange question, right? Mm, and now, in order to benefit the most from Dilly's uh, wonderful detailed answer, takes him uh, a whole chapter of that book to this very peculiar query, I will be drawing from Peirce's semiotic pragmatism and I will contrast it with William James' own take on pragmatism, particularly from the lectures he gave in 1906 in New York City, if my memory is correct, and that was published, they were published later in a book in 1907 called Pragmatism. I will also briefly, very briefly, revisit the notion of frame, frame, which I will draw from Gregory Bateson, Irving Goffman, the social Bateson, okay, is the kind of polymath from biology, philosophy. He worked with psychiatrists, okay, on schizophrenia and so forth. Irving Goffman, who founded the field of microsociology, okay, a Canadian um, scholar from his book from 1974, Frame Analysis, okay, an essay on the organization of experience. And a related concept, this is a greeting to the uh, kind uh, acceptance of comment in my paper of Professor Luis de Miranda, whom I think has worked or is works on psychology. This is from Argentinian theorist Jose Blecher, who was a psychoanalyst. And in 1960, he wrote a fine paper on the encuadre. Encuadre is more or less the frame, okay? But in the psychoanalytic setting, not related to Bateson or to Goffman. My aim is to compare these notions, okay, of these three, uh, thinkers uh, with the triadic relation about which Dili has said so many wonderful things. Can we go to the next? Okay, here go uh, the book Basics of Semiotics I wanted to show you. And uh, this is, uh, I said, Dili's take on relation triadically. And this is the challenge. How can we grasp what is invisible? I remember Mark Champagne's uh, presentation in this seminar a couple of weeks or, or a month ago, in which he said that the interpretant is the hardest to grasp in the object representament interpretant because we don't see it. But that's the whole point, right? That's what semiosis means, the generation of a more complex sign, the effect, the meaning, right? Which is different from the object, what we're talking about, and how we express it, the medium, if it's a film, if it's a gesture, if it's a smell, okay? And so I quote here uh, John Dilly saying, I quote, a relation in the sense constitutive of the sign in the being proper to it as sign cannot be seen or touched. This is the, the crucial thing. You see, it's a paradox, right? Like the firstness, I remember John Dilly at a conference of the American, uh, so the Society of, uh, the Semiotic Society of America in Toronto some years ago, when we were sort of friends already. Uh, and he said, firstness, the, the category, right, of phenomenology of first, you try to speak about it and it's gone, it's infuriating. Well, uh, a relation is somehow like this is the most important thing in semiotic theory, in Persian semiotic theory and in Dilly's elaboration of it, but it cannot be touched, it cannot be grasped. And he explains it, it can be understood, but without that understanding, it cannot be grasped directly at all. This is what Peirce says somewhere, right? Uh, scientific intelligence. What is a scientific intelligence for Peirce? Any uh, being that can learn, that is open to learning. In other words, when symbols grow, as Peirce says somewhere, right? And uh, this is uh, what we can do about the understanding, right? Is grasping the meaning of science. And here comes a quote in Dili of Jacques Maritain, quotes several times, 
animals make use of signs, but they don't know they are signs. Maritain noticed noted that is to say, I quote Maritain in Dili, without perceiving the relation of signification. Why, why is that important? Why have I put that part of Maritain, which I could have skipped? Very simply, I think the fact that we not only use signs, we homo sapiens, but also are keenly aware of the signs. Like now I'm keenly aware of my accent, which is not American or British, but Latin American, Hispanic, as I would be called in the US, I guess how they put in the passport and your ID, right? Hispanic. And so I'm, I'm keenly aware of it. I'm trying, I'm hoping against hope that this can be understood uh, given the limitation of this non-face-to-face -face encounter and so on. But what happens when this uh, affordance, this capacity of human beings, not only of saying words, but knowing that the words and regretting having said something, okay, when we say, oh, how silly, you see, you're less silly because you're talking about the self that you were a moment before when you made a mistake, when you said something wrong or you forgot saying something in a lecture. And so you're painfully aware this is this self-consciousness is at the heart of the problem I'm trying to present to you today. Uh, Eduardo Coutinho, for example, the documentary, the Brazilian documentary filmmaker, begins one of his great films called Edificio Master, as I already mentioned, okay, the name of this building uh, on Copacabana uh, Street, uh, entering with three cameras at the same time. There is the cameraman that we don't see that films what we watch at the beginning. There is a uh, CCTV, closed circuit television, which is typical of all buildings nowadays, practically in, in Western society. It means a discrete or not so discrete camera. And we can see that what it's filming, the people that are coming to the building to make a documentary in a small monitor, black and white, a small TV set that the person at the reception, right, the doorman is watching and it's a way of surveillance. And then there is a third camera. And it is another cameraman that goes with director Coutinho inside the elevator. So we have three cameras. That is called reflexivity. That is being painfully aware that you are affecting, you're changing the world that you are uh, invading, if you wish, with all that machinery, right? You're going to do something out of the common. You are going to film the live world. You're going to film those uh, people who live there, who agree, obviously, to let you inside their apartment. And we see a collection of very heterogeneous, different ages, different attitudes to life in that uh, marvelous film. But here is my point. Uh, there is no uh, more authentic, no truer life than the life in a relation. It's not necessarily true, of course, that we can lie, we can pretend, we can invent things that never happened, okay? We have this fictional capacity, not necessarily in film at any time in our lives, right? But uh, I think that the premise that these documentary makers is dualistic, right? That uh, they think that when you're not being filmed, when you are just living, anything that you say or do, okay, has a characteristic that immediately perishes, vanishes, goes out of the window when you're filmed. And anything that you say now is uh, painfully, dreadfully affected by the fact of being filmed. I don't agree at all. I think that the life of human beings, of animals, of anything that is alive, is a relational life, okay, in the sense that Dili explains. So let's go on, please. Okay, I will very briefly go here. This is Bateson, classic steps to an ecology of the mind, 1973. But in fact, he presents a concept that he introduced in the Macy conferences of 1955, which is the mood signs. He realized that uh, animals, not human, uh, have a certain sign that says, I'm not going to attack you, monkeys, he observed in a, in a zoo, but I'm going to play with you. This is a bite that is not a bite. I'm playing with it, okay? And then he mentions in this very first uh, lecture from 55, Gregory Bateson says, the drama precipitated when organisms have in it of the fruit of tree knowledge. That is, when we become aware that we have used a certain word, a certain gesture, and we regret it or we celebrate it. That changes everything from the monkey play. And then he says uh, later, he says, a message or meaningful act could be emitted as a message to influence another organism. Like this is play. It's a message that defines a context, a frame. There is the word frame, you see. I think that Bateson, as many others, I will quote, okay, 
um, Hofmeier, a wonderful biosematician who passed away a few years ago. He says, uh, Bateson, and I agree, I couldn't agree more, should have used Spurs, not uh, Russell and Whitehead, okay? The logic, uh, type logic and so on, because uh, this is play, in my view, is an interpretive, okay? It's uh, a teleology, it's uh, a way to cause something to happen that is not attack, is not serious business, it's just play, like in ritual. We go to the next. And here is Erwin Goffman's classic book, Frame Analysis from 1934, in which he uses Bateson term frame. And he says, uh, it's very interesting because I never saw, I think I read the whole work, okay? He died, unfortunately, young in 1982, Erwin Goffman. Uh, he never used purse. The only thing close to semiotic is one quote to Roland Barthes, okay? Fé one of the early 1950s work, but uh, there is so much Persian stuff there that is waiting to be explored, I find, in Erwin Goffman. And here is what he says, definitions of a situation. This is what uh, is the whole work about, this 600 pages almost. That is all the time we're worried as human beings to define what's going on and what our role is in what's going on. And he says, our subjective involvement in situations. Frame is the word I use. Okay, and he takes it from Bateson. The next. Uh, and here, interestingly enough, he comes close, unaware, I'm sure, of Peirce. Uh, he uses William James, he admires William James. He uses it in, in a few of his books, Goffman again. He says, I will follow a tradition established by James in a famous chapter, The Perception of Reality from 1869, when our friend Peirce was publishing some of his anti cartesian texts, for instance. Instead of asking what reality is, says Goffman, he gave matters a subversive phenomenological twist, italicizing the following question. Under what circumstances do we think things are real? This is very important, right? Because uh, genre, for example, fiction, right? A drama that could take place in a building identical to the one where the documentary uh, Edificio Master takes place could very nice become a soap opera or a melodrama or a thriller, right? But under circumstances that are radically changed, in which we have a script, we have a director, and there is no fresh talk. That's the expression Goffman uses in his last book, Forms of Talk, which is what I'm doing now. I'm trying to read and bring my own, okay, two grains, two uh, cents of, of wisdom, if there's any, uh, to commend them so it's less boring. Can we go to the next? Okay, here's a psychoanalyst. I will just read the bottom uh, quote. This is Jose Blecher, who talks about encuadre, which is a Spanish word for frame, and he's speaking about the importance of the frame in the psychoanalytic situation. I quote Blecher now from 1960. I'm pretty sure he was unaware of Bateson and of Goffman, okay? But what he says is akin to what they have proposed, and also I find to Persian thirdness and relation if you uh, follow my reasoning. The frame wrote Blecher, if it's invariable, for example, setting the time when the psychoanalyst will meet the patient, the money they will pay, uh, that if he doesn't come or she doesn't come, he will pay anyway, and so on. Turns out to be decisive for the phenomena of the process of behavior. The frame is a meta behavior, okay? Like Goffman speak, uh, sorry, uh, Bateson speaks of meta communication. This is play is a communication or message about another message. What I'm going to do now from now on is all, okay, uh, a play. Mm? Like here, everything I'm talking is not to sell you anything, the complete words of government or anything, but it's a lecture. It's a participation in a seminar. It's the nature of the semiotic uh, behavior, okay? And so he says, the frame is a meta behavior and the phenomena that we acknowledge as behaviors depend on it is the implicit but the explicit depends on it. This is very interesting. That is, uh, he talks about a patient that refuses to discuss the frame uh, and he calls it the phantom zone. The psychoanalyst theorist uh, Blecher says, uh, he has put inside the frame very important issues about the cure, the talk cure that Freud founded, right? And he doesn't want to touch them. And that's exactly where the, the problem lies, the issue lies, he says, okay? We go to the next, please, Robert. 
Okay, and this is Hofmeyer saying, I will say it very briefly, that Bateson gets so close to Peirce, but why doesn't he use Peirce? We will never know, okay? I think he was aware of him, but he says, as soon as we accept the reality of sign processes of relative being, you see there we have Dilly, we have Peirce, and we have Bateson, even though he uses Russell, unfortunately. Uh, we also immediately see the deep significance of Bateson's lifelong attempt to determine the pattern that connects. That's a very famous phrase, okay? I will read it to you in a moment. Nature and culture. This is cynicism, of course, that between nature and culture, our nature is to produce culture, is to produce tradition, okay? To leave to the future generations, like Peirce did, those wonderful eight volumes of the collected papers, even though they are like uh, very maligned, according to Dilly. Okay, they were uh, given to students of philosophy. Okay, uh, like Harshan and Weiss. But uh, something is something, and now we have the writings. Okay, the chronological edition. Semiosis says Jesper Hofmeyer in this book on semiotic is constitutive both of these realms of nature and culture. Evolution and thinking are made up of the same stuff, and the name of this stuff is relative being. This is what I think makes a person. OK, all the time we are producing concrete identities about that. Norbert Willy, if somebody is interested, has a wonderful book from 1994 called The Semiotic Self. And there is a more extraordinary or as extraordinary book from 1989 by Vincent Colapietro, who was recently at the seminar okay, with Francesco Bellucci. I, I could enjoy that, uh, that human beings are this self-interpretative process. That's the self. And we keep producing concrete identities. Like now I'm speaking in English, but I'm not laughing at myself because it's necessary to communicate to a wider audience than if I spoke in Spanish, which is my mother tongue. Next one. Okay, uh, he, here we have uh, Dilly's beginning to answer, what happens to the parent of a dead child? Is he or she, right, still a parent? And here comes the answer to that odd question. Right away, writes Dilly, in this basic of semiotic, it's easy to see that being a parent or becoming a parent in the minimal sense results from an action that is over and above the being of each of the individuals as independent biological organisms in their own right. I think it's very important what he's saying here. He's not disregarding the physical, biological dimension, okay, or level of becoming a parent of an offspring of a child, but he's saying that even when that child dies, uh, very tragic, it's so tragic, there is all that grief and this mourning that can last a lifetime, okay? Because uh, forever this person, this man, this woman will be known, will understand, okay, themselves and people will understand them as being the parent of a dead child. That is, uh, as the biological entity, the existing entity disappears, okay, goes to the grave, not the relationship, which never perishes. Can we go to the next, please? Okay, here's when he says it, okay? The sign relation, this is Dili again, never perishes. He says the relation, objective and physical, uh, throughout the book, uh, Dili uh, opposes thing, which is what merely is out there to object, which is when we have the percept. When we encounter that thing, okay, it's secondness already and on its way to becoming understood, even if it's misunderstood, right? If now we have all this huge problem, all right, of uh, romantic relationships, misunderstood signs, I thought that uh, he or she was telling me to advance and so on. But this is the object and finally comes obviously the meaning. And so he says the relation objective and physical, merely physical, because you can be the parent unawares of a child, you leave and, and you don't know that this uh, person had a child, okay, you never knew or you died immediately after. This is distinct, the relation and superordinate to the individual being of both parent and child. What comes now, I think, is, is beautifully written by Dilly, very clear. It's not merely that intelligible aspect proper to the individual being of both, whereby, henceforward, in order to be fully understood, each must be thought in connection with the other. This permanent aspect of intelligibility. I will, I will stop there. That is, forever you have defined yourself, you, you understand yourself, whether you're a good or bad parent, whether you abandon, hopefully not, or you are always by the side of the child that you engendered with somebody, okay? Uh, this uh, phenomenon, this 
uh, creature uh, will change forever your identity, yourself, okay? Whether you forget it or you keep it in mind all the time and you fulfill wonderful your parental duties, you're now, you now have this permanent aspect of intelligibility, okay? Remember King Lear, the, the tragedy of Shakespeare, at the end when the mad, okay, finally come into his senses, King Lear, poor, abandoned, okay, realizes that Cordelia, okay, is dead, mm, uh, has this, a very intense moment of grief, okay? He recovers his senses together with this enormous loss, the awareness of the loss. So obviously he's very much still the parent of Cordelia, the only good one of the daughters that he rejected, you see, in this act of hybrids of excess. Can we go to the next, please? Okay, here I found the, the kinship between uh, Blecher, the psychoanalyst, uh, Bateson, the biologist, and, and the free thinker that he was, and Goffman. Uh, Persis teleology, that is so important to understand semiosis, right, the growth. We have the famous uh, sentence of Bateson first from his Mind and Nature book. What pattern, says Bateson, connects the crab to the lobster and the orchid to the primrose and all the four of them to me, and me to you, and all the six of us to the amoeba, in one direction and to the backward schizophrenic in another. This, this refers to uh, Bateson's work in Palo Alto with the schizophrenia, right? In which he tried to deal it as a communication problem. And so here comes a quote, okay, uh, from the collected papers. I quote Peirce, mind has its universal mode of action, namely by final causation. This is teleology, of course, final causation. And observe that he uses the same example than Bateson, okay, in the pattern that connects us to the most, the simplest possible form of life in, in nature. The mi microscopist looks to see whether the motions of a little creature show any purpose. If so, there is mind there. That is so bold, right? 19th century, hmm? end of 19th century. Uh, this is bold. As, as much as Peirce speaks of externalized mind, okay, uh, famous quote, remember, somebody filches my inkstand, I cannot uh, write as much as if somebody cuts my head, he says, because to draw his famous existential graphs and diagrams, Peirce, the semiotician, the logician, definitely needed the ink, okay, and the paper in which he was he left us all this wonderful nachlas, his, his work. So there is mind there outside in books, in social media, okay, anywhere, and of course, in language. Please, the next. Here is another quote from Hofmeier speaking about Bateson, okay, but we can skip it. He's basically saying that there is purse all over the place in Bateson, even though he never used, it, he used his work or acknowledges that, okay. Another one. Okay, here comes Dilly's answer to the question, is the parent of a dead child still a parent, right? And I, I said, this is thirdness or the pattern that connects Bateson. I quote now John Dilly. open quotation. The foundation of the relation of parenthood in any given case is a determined outcome of a determined action. Okay, this is the biological, of course. There has to be, okay, uh, the coming together of a female and a male in order to engender, right, a child, mm, a baby. But the relation itself goes on dealing is neither the contingent action nor its determined outcome. Contingent because, as I said, the man, for instance, could have engendered a child, taking a sheep, you know, the, the, sheep, the sheep sank, he drowned, he never knew he was the feather of that girl or boy. And here comes the ending goes really the relation is the pattern observe he uses the same term that baits on all over the place the relation is the pattern the thirdness the category of thirdness of symbol and so on linking the two and superordinate to each okay so this is i think a wonderful contribution in this book which i repeat basic of semiotic is much more than basic is complex but worth reading several times and there of course i put the triadic scheme right of the object, which is no longer the thing. I'm thinking of dynamical object as a thing. There is the immediate object, sign or representament, and then the effect, interpretant, which is, for example, the documentary, right? And the signs that the documentary engenders in, in both the crew that made the film and obviously the people, the audience who watches. 
the next. Um, okay, we will skip this one. Okay, I think we, we have enough of Bateson. Here comes uh, one that I to present before going uh, just two more, I go to the film, okay, to the sequence of this documentary, Joe the Sena. I call it Persis Rainbow Realism, and I find it is an example, an instance of cynicism, the logic of continuity, okay? Even mind and matter are continuous at Pers. Matter is a fit mind. Uh, it, it means it's mind that no longer evolves, right? It has become rigid with habit. So here comes Pers. It says, he says, it follows from our own existence, which is proved by the occurrence of ignorance and error. That's fallibilism, right? Which is proved by the occurrence of ignorance and error that everything which is present to us is a phenomenal manifestation of ourselves. What does it mean? For somebody who expected me, for instance, to speak about documentaries and George Grierson, who identified the quote, famous quote about the creative treatment of actuality, uh, this already, this uh, talk, this seminar is a failure. And the person says, I, I've been cheated. I want, cannot say I want my money back, right? Because there's no money bought. But says, I'm, I'm wasting my time. I has already left, okay? And uh, that means that there is always a projection, right? There is an accent, if you allow me. It's an accented view of life because we are all the time leaving our traces, okay? In the way we talk, we think, we move. Our culture comes with us, okay? Uh, as uh, somebody in Italo Calvino, great novelist, okay, uh, when he was telling the great Khan about the, 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 all the journeys he made to come back, okay, to the great Khan in invisible cities. Um, and he says, there is one city, said the Khan one night after uh, Marco Polo told all about the wonderful cities he had visited of the infinitely big realm of the, of the great Khan. It says, Marco Polo, there is one city about which you never speak, you never mention. What is it, my, my, my lord? Answer Marco Polo, worried. I mean, you don't make your can angry, right? And he says, you never speak of Venice. Marco Polo came from Venice. And the answer is wonderful. He said, I've always been talking about Venice. I've always been talking about Venice. Whenever I talk about another city that I visited for you, can I talk about Venice, meaning that the, the city you were born in, the language you were born in, okay, the first gestures, right, everything that surrounded you, your environment, your parents, and so on, whoever, you know, uh, raised you, is forever in you, okay? So that's a phenomenal manifestation. But continues, Pers, because if he stopped here, okay, he would be dualistic. He would be saying, as, as Dili will observe in a moment in one of my slides, idealism. We can only know what we ourselves make. That's not what he says. First goes on and says, this does not prevent its being a phenomenon of something without us, just as a rainbow is at once a manifestation both of the sun and of the rain. This is what pragmatism, semiotic offers us, that even though we cannot but put an accent in everything we perceive and understand, right? Given to our limitations, our humanity, that doesn't mean there is something out there that we are coming to know fallibly incompletely, but forever approaching that dynamical object transforming to final interpretant, right? The final meaning that comes in the long run. Can we go to another one? Okay, here we have William James in those lectures of 1906, published in 1907, coming, in my view, you will tell me if you agree or not, uh, close to Peirce's rainbow realism. I quote uh, William James now. It is identically our pragmatistic conception in our cognitive as well as in our active life. We are creative. Observe the word creative, the same one that, okay, uh, this documentarist, okay, uh, used, okay, the creative treatment. We add both to the subject and to the predicate part of reality. The world stands really malleable, waiting to receive its final touches at our hands. Like the kingdom of heaven, it suffers human violence willingly man engenders truths upon it. There, I think, uh, the capital letters belong to William James. I didn't put them, they're right there, okay, their emphasis. I find that he says man engenders truths if he means that there is fallibilism in every conclusion we arrive at, yes. But if he means that we are constructing in the sense treated by Ian Hacking, 
in the book, The Social Construction of What, 1999, okay? I don't agree and I don't think Peirce would agree. That's why he came up with the term pragmatism. So ugly, such an ugly word, he says, that we'll keep it safe from kidnappers, right? Because he didn't agree with things that James and others at the time, okay, when he was living, were doing under the name pragmatism. Can we go to the next? Here is where, uh, this is the most important quotation that I want to show you uh, to contrast, to make a big, big difference with uh, Persian uh, synarchism, with Persian, okay, relation, and with what Dili wrote uh, about relation and relative being. This is in the same book, 1907, Pragmatism. This is William James. I quote him. This is very, very, I mean, uh, I find it a very important uh, idea, but I haven't seen it treated too much in the literature. This is what he said and then published. We may glimpse reality. We may glimpse reality, catch a flash, right? Catch a gla passing glance. But we never grasp it. What we grasp is always some substitute for it, for reality, which some previous human thinking has peptonized and cooked for a consumption. Observe the metaphors, right? Gastronomic. Peptonized means digested. It's what the enzymes, the peptides do to whatever we eat and cooked, right? So whenever, okay, we think we grasp reality, what we grasp is what some other people have thought and have peptonized and cooked so as we could consume it. And goes on William James, if so vulgar an expression were allowed us, we might say that wherever we find it, it is reality, it has been already faked. The emphasis is in the original. I just put the yellow. What he's saying for me is exactly, I think, would be embraced, would be cherished, celebrated by all the theorists, okay, uh, that I will show you in a minute, but I would like you to have an audiovisual break, I will show you now. Uh, I will ask Robert instead to show you this fragment because I think that this idea of representations uh, fake in reality is at the heart of the poetics of documentary makers and the theorists or theoreticians of uh, documentary makers. But let's watch now, okay? Uh, Jogo de Sina, the, the, the ending, okay? With Sarita, the only woman who returns to the stage. I will tell you something about the production after we watch it but I, I leave continue here. It has subtitles, right? It is subtitled. Mas Sarita quer dizer você então de todas que vieram até agora, mais 18 pessoas, sei lá, você é a única que pediu para voltar porque você queria acrescentar alguma coisa ou cantar, não sei exatamente, me explica isso. É porque eu queria cantar só e nem o motivo principal é que eu achei que o negócio ficou muito barra pesada. Em que sentido? Uh, trágico. Mais para trágico do que para cômico. E aí eu achei que ia ficar uma coisa muito triste. E eu não queria ficar muito triste. Entendeu? Sim. Então a música sempre quebra um pouco, né? E o meu pai era uma pessoa que ele entrava em casa cantando. Entendeu? Era música marchinha de carnaval. Qualquer, qualquer assunto tinha uma marchinha de carnaval. Ele chegava, já. E né, eu achava engraçado aquela pessoa que trabalhava com um louco, um alucinado, chegava em casa, botava a chave na porta e saía e entrava cantando. Era o figuraço, entendeu? E assim, o repertório dele. E a minha mãe era uma mulher extremamente musical, assim, uma coisa fantástica. Ele era mais conhecedor de música e tal. E, mas, sabe, cantava tudo, desde marcha de carnaval, a Tito Esquipa, a. É, de Piaf, a, a Martini, ele era tarado, Ari Barroso, e assim vai. Então, são as músicas da nossa, da nossa vida, né? Você gostaria de cantar uma música que tenha um significado para você? Ou que seja... Aí tem aí, pois é, aí tem um mundo, né? Não, mas o mundo, Não dá. do mundo você tem que escolher, se for o caso, uma que você acha. Que... Uma? Sei lá, que de Pois é, isso que eu fiquei, que né? Que você Sim, acha importante. que você cante bem, ou que você fale bem, porque às vezes não precisa nem cantar algo. Mas tem alguma que marcou assim, que justifique que você cante? Ela? É que eu, eu fico presa no passado, né? um negócio estranho isso. Eu fico presa nas coisas do meu pai. Tudo bem que seja no passado, mas o passado e o presente é uma coisa. É mais ou menos, né? Porque as pessoas não conhecem, né? Não é porque... O que teu pai cantava? Não, porque é. Meu pai nenava, o que é isso? 
Essas eu não então, esqueço, não. E aí eu vou começar a chorar, Ai, meu Jesus do Senhor, isso não vai ter brincadeira. Mas aí é que são boas, acho que teu pai ninava. Meu pai ninava, minha mãe ninava, minha avó ninava e eu ninava minha filha. Com que música? Lembra uma que é essa, Gia? Como é que eu vou cantar chorando? Ah. Se essa rua, se essa rua fosse minha... Não vou conseguir. Eu mandava, eu mandava ladrilhar com pedrinhas, com pedrinhas de brilhante para o meu, para o meu amor passar. Nessa rua, nessa rua tem um bosque. Nessa rua, nessa rua. Que se chama, que se chama solidão. Que se chama, dentro que se dele, chama Dentro dele mora um anjo. Dentro dele, dentro dele mora um anjo. Que roubou, que roubou, que roubou meu coração. Que roubou meu coração. Se eu roubei, se eu roubei se teu roubei, coração. Coração. É porque, é porque, é porque te quero bem. É porque te quero bem. Se eu roubei, se eu roubei se teu eu coração. Se eu roubei teu é coração. É porque tu roubaste o meu também. É porque tu ah, essa roubaste é uma. o meu também. Okay, uh, we can continue now the presentation. Let me just give you some background on the film that maybe many or, or all of you, none of you has watched, okay? It's, it's an extraordinary experiment because uh, he puts an ad uh, asking ordinary women to come and tell a story, like Sarita, the only one who comes twice to the stage of this empty theater in Rio de Janeiro. But he also asks actresses, some famous like Marilia Pera, this echo you listened in the in the background is Marília Pera, an, an incredible uh, TV, cinema, theater actress, Brazil, uh, who died unfortunately two or three years ago, to perform. Uh, they they only watch the video, okay, the filming of the uh, stories brought by these ordinary women, unknown, okay, by by the public, and uh, the transcript and nothing else, no direction, nothing. They they had to come and they come to the stage, okay. So the first appearance of Sarita, who is a force of nature. There are so many untranslatable things in what she says. She, when, when Coutinho, that you cannot see but you can hear, he's sitting across her on this, on this stage of this deserted theater, says, uh, why did you come again? Why did you ask of all the women, the only one who asked, okay? And, and she says, o negocio ficou barra pesada. It's no translation, okay? It's a very poor thing to say heavy. It means, this is not me. This is a very sad, forlorn image of myself. You see the self-consciousness that we all have when we come out of an interview or an encounter with an important human being and we said how stupid I was, how, how much I did not uh, succeed in, in conveying my feelings, my true emotions. I was like a clown, an idiot, right? And Sarita comes there to be cheerful. The woman who did not want not to be cheerful is one of my slides I'll show you afterwards, right? And so what is the purpose? What is the point of her coming back? to sing a song. She says in Portuguese, a música sempre quebra um pouco, which was not translated, okay, by the poor translator, I, and I sympathize. It says, music always breaks a little bit. Breaks means the sadness, breaks the bad mood. And can you imagine what can be more predictable than a Brazilian woman singing Brazilian music? all the music that she knows from Carnival. This will be a moment of ecstasy, a moment of, unrestricted uh, joy, okay? And there is this fabulous moment when she says, okay, how will I sing while I cry? Remember that she claimed not to cry. And, and I will uh, try to do a little semiotic analysis of that paradox, right? But the point, and then uh, I will ask Robert to bring the slides again, is that uh, who we see is not the character Sarita, it's a person, it's a human being. It would be so wrong to say, so against common sense, critical common senseism, as Peirce calls it, to say that Sarita went the second time to cry on a stage, to break out crying, to pour some tears. On the contrary, she came to be cheerful because she's a force of nature. I invite you to watch the first uh, time that Sarita is there. 
uh, she's funny, but she ends up crying for the daughter that lives in the US and they're not in touch. They, they have fallen apart, okay? And that's why Coutinho is so incredibly, uh, I would say, insightful and, and so right when he says, did your father, okay, sing lullabies, okay? And that brings tears to her eyes because she didn't know that she was going to cry for the second time because who is crying is a person. This is not a rehearsal. You know how you say rehearsal in French? Repetition, that's great. You repeat a script, you prepare a script in a film, in the theater, right? On television for a play, but not, okay? Not in life, not in a documentary of people who live and who tell a sad story about themselves. So this is my whole point. Robert, Robert, can you please put again the slide so I, I can finish the presentation? Thank you very much. Sorry to be bothering you, but okay. All right, we will skip this one about cynicism, all right, which uh, cuts all in unrelated elements. Here, I call it Persian steps to correct the dualistic account of representation of documentary films, which by the way, is not only documentary films. There is an enormous, I would say, <laughs> Uh, virus, right? Dualistic virus haunting mankind, okay? That divides, creates uh, what is called in Spanish agrieta, okay? Uh, the pandemic, for example, bought agrieta between those who uh, are obeying, say, all the protocols and things, and those who decide to question it, and there is a total breach, okay? And so those who question it, instead of being called skeptical, are called lunatic, or are called very ugly names, that is dualism at work. And so Per says the essence of existence is reaction. Okay? Sarita reacts the second time by once again feeling all the pathos of the strange daughter that she cannot talk to because she doesn't want to talk to her mother anymore, to Sarita. And then Pers, uh, in, in the collected papers, that was a manuscript says, whatever exists is individual, since existence, not reality. That's a confusion of dualism, right? Existence is dual. If you stop listening to me now because your computer breaks down or your Wi-Fi falls down, that is dualism. There is a Wi-Fi or there isn't, right? But you know that the thing went on, the seminar went on. That's part of reality, but you had an accident, right? Which is purely in the realm of uh, anxiety, of secondness. And individuality are essentially the same thing. What do documentaries show us? thanks to the great uh, attitude, okay? The gift that somebody like Coutinho had to encounter people without being intellectual, without analyzing them, being a true humanist in the sense of being open to anything in shanty towns, okay? Like Babylonia dos Mil, where he goes to a shanty town in the hills of Rio de Janeiro, the last day of the 20th century in 1999, okay? Or to a middle-class building like Edificio Master, or to an empty theater, like the one we saw. Mm. The next, uh, we sh we'll skip this one, okay? It's about cynicism also. <clears throat> oh, here it comes, John Grierson, okay? The Scottish documentary or the creative treatment of actuality is a new art with no such background in the story and the stage as the studio product so glibly possesses. It's a kind of critical attitude, right? Like in Dogma 95 by Lars von Trier and colleagues in, in Denmark, okay? A cinema that neorealism, okay? In the 1940s in Italy, tries to do without all the Hollywood machinery. But that doesn't mean that you transform people in characters as I will try to show you and come to the ending of my presentation. We go next. Let's skip this one of James, it's interesting, but anyone who wants the, uh, the slides, I'm happy to, to send them to you. Here is a nice one by Dili again, 1990. The conflict, says Dili, is between an idealist perspective in which the mind knows only what it constructs and the semiotic perspective, contrary to that, in which what the mind constructs and what is partially prejacent to these constructions interweave objectively to constitute indistinctly what is directly experienced and known. What we see is a woman, which you just saw it with me, right? Sarita, who has this grief, this enormous grief, right? Of the lost daughter, okay? And she comes to give a second, uh, the best impression she can of herself. She's not satisfied with being shown breaking down 
the first time, okay? This is no reality show. This is a, a fine documentary, experimental documentary, because we get two sets of narratives, right? We have the ordinary women who come and tell their story, okay, their life story, and then we have the actresses, some of whom are anonymous. So sometimes you cannot tell who is the actress and who is the ordinary person. That's a, a subtlety of the film. And here we have, okay, Sarita breaking down. When she came, she said, and I believe her, who would like to go for a second time to a film in order to break down again when she perceives herself as a person full of euphoria, of, of life force, energy. And if you watch the first time, you realize that she's right. She is energetic, she is enthusiastic. She even laughs at Coutinho, the director at some points, it's, it's a wonderful moment, okay? But she cannot uh, prevail over the feelings she has that come out at just a very silly question when she says, did your father sing lullabies? And then she says, everyone sang lullabies in my family and I used to sing lullabies for my daughter. And then she breaks down and still she sings because she came to sing. Next one. Here is my summary of the poetics of documentary, okay, and the theory of documentary. A powerful, unanimous, reflexive discourse. The prevalence of the notion of character in the theory. What is the character, okay? It's used in the theory and by filmmakers, which I respect and admire, like Coutinho, to refer to any and every person that accepts to be filmed in a documentary. Remember, this is not candid camera or reality show. This is people, these are people who have signed and accepted to uh, participate in a film uh, and do what uh, Erwin Goffman calls self-enactment, to play themselves, okay, through a story, through a narrative. What is my goal? I want to argue against this claim of the person becoming a character in a film from the perspective of triadic semiotic, and I will use both Peirce, triadic model, and Dilly's description of semiosis. I claim that it is the person, the human being, such as we are, full of contradictions, inconsistencies, fallible to the end, okay, that the documentary genre represents. Please, another one. Uh, this is a very influential French intellectual filmmaker and theorist, Jean-Louis Comoly, one of the founders of Cahiers de Cinéma, okay, in France, uh, a very influential uh, magazine about cinema. And he says, the cinema really produces the reality, which by a leisure de man, it seems to show, but it's a red herring, a leurre, the bait of fiction in the documentary. The belief of the viewer is somehow warranted by the idea that reality exists." End of quote. You see, uh, these are uh, like Prometheus. They try to get the authenticity out of life and put it in a film, in a documentary, but they do it with this existentialist, uh, I would say pessimistic, even nihilistic idea. Let me show you a couple of quotes from Coutinho now, please, uh, where he says it in his own mind. This is Coutinho, you see at the bottom, okay? In an interview, he says, I call it the dualistic approach to reality one. The documentary is shaped by the questioning of that objectivity, of that possibility of dealing with the real. The great documentary isn't only based on this presupposition, it also thematizes, pay attention here, the impossibility of dealing with whatever it is that may be called real. You cannot have a more negative view, a more pessimistic view, uh, and uh, what he says now is the kernel of their mistake, I find, the fallacy. In front of this real, he says between commas like this, every documentary deep down is precarious, incomplete, imperfect. Now, what is the mistake? Of course, he's not a semiotician or a philosopher, and that's what gives my job, okay, this uh, opportunity to use it to think about person and life. Every sign, is precarious, incomplete, and imperfect. This is the beauty of Persian fallibilism. There is no way that we can get it from the first time or the second or the third or the infinite time. Otherwise, there would be no seminar, no John Dilly. There would be nobody still working hard at getting it right, knowing that most of the time we don't get it totally right or we get it totally wrong, okay? The famous phrase, remember, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, no doubt, Peirce was a giant, okay? He, he really changed the idea of meaning and philosophy and so on in his uh, admirable effort, even though he was outside of university most of his life, he still never gave up. 
So I think what is the big fallacy here? That any there can be any sign that is not precarious, incomplete, or imperfect. Every sign is like that, not just the documentary, not mainly the documentary. Can we get another one? Uh, another one, also by Coutinho. It's not possible for the filmmaker or photographer to nourish the illusion that he or she is filming the real. We're always filming an encounter. I couldn't agree more. What we watch there is the encounter between Sarita and him. I don't know if you notice his voice. At one point, Coutinho gets grouchy. He was famous for being grouchy, but it's just perfect for that encounter because he keeps asking her, uh, weren't you going to sing a song? And she says, I don't know which one to choose. There are so many. And she goes on and on. You see, she's beating her time. She's trying not to go there because maybe unconsciously she fears that she will break down again. And he gets more impatient and says, choose one song. OK, just choose any song. Right. And, and that is the encounter. OK, it's the opposite, as he says, somewhere from a TV chronicle where you just want a yes or a no, and all the questions are already answered, and that has absolutely no value, okay? This encounter comes close, I don't know what uh, Professor Luis de Miranda will say, come close to the talking, uh, talking cure, to the encounter between the analyst and, and the patient, right? The encounter between the world of the filmmaker goes on continue, mediated by the camera, yes, but if it's not by the camera, it's mediated by your eyes, there is no Okay, there is direct and mediated perception, direct and mediated. Joseph Ransel says that. It's direct because it's what comes through the person, through the five senses, but it's always mediated by our knowledge, by our ignorance, by our prejudices, by your experiences, right? So if it's not the camera, the eyes are the same as the camera. Obviously, the product is different. Everybody can watch the film, okay, and admire it. I, I hope you will watch Jogo de Sena later on, but you cannot watch what I'm watching now, what I'm imagining your reactions are because this device, okay, the Zoom-like thing is, is not very generous in that sense. But he says, most of my films begin with a crew, etc. One more, okay, and we're coming to the end. I think uh, let's, uh, here he says, a verbal act is provoked, catalyzed. I couldn't agree more. There is a catalysis, right? But observe the ending of the quote. To film, says Coutinho, is to provoke, catalyze that moment. It is in the interaction that takes place in the filming process that a great character, personagem, is born. Couldn't disagree more, couldn't disagree. Personagem is Capitu, the heroine of Machado de Assis, Don Casmurro, is Ophelia, Lady Macbeth of Shakespeare. Those are characters, right, which were born from the tradition that fed Shakespeare, okay, he always got his stories from other stories, and he creates a text that is put on a stage. That's a character, eh? immortal characters, the Don Quixote and so on, but not Sarita. Sarita is not a character, not a character. When Goffman says that we are characters in a, uh, a scene that is well staged, it means it's a role we play. If somebody doesn't believe a thing I'm saying, is he or she's thinking, this is a charlatan. I think he never read Dili or Purse or whatever, okay? That is a role. That would be impersonating falsely something I have no legitimate right, okay? This is losing face and so on. Can we skip the next one? I want to get to the end, skip it. Okay, this, these are theorists, okay? There's a whole book called uh, a personage in a documentary de Coutinho. The car is a PhD dissertation. The character in Coutinho's, okay, is talking about the theater. We skip this one. Okay, and this is a very famous, uh, wonderful uh, theoretician, Ismael Xavier from Brazil. The same thing theater, uh, camera effect, okay, masks. There are many ways in which a subject or character comes into the scene, composes her image, okay? You saw what happens when Sarita tried to compose a very cool, aloof uh, person on the stage because she didn't want to be more tragic than comedy. She feels that she is more a, a person who is fun, who is light, okay? She didn't want to be barra pesada. She didn't want to give this very negative uh, impression, but you saw what happened. A next one. Okay, we, uh, here I said, the dualist approach underlies these theoretical studies and also the reflections of documentary makers, it's poet, their poetics. They all posit the inevitable presence of the character, okay? 
because of what they believe to be an absolute division. You see, this is dualism between the filmed world and what exists outside the film world. Sarita outside, what I'm, what I'm claiming is that Sarita outside and inside, with all the changes that I grant, of course, because she's in a very weird uh, in, in environment, okay? She's surrounded by the machinery, by the microphone that we don't see, and the camera, and an empty theater, which she never goes, okay? She's not an actress, but it's still enough transpires to see the person, to see what is bothering her, what's eating her, right? The grief that comes out. We skip this one. I conclude by saying, uh, please, the previous one, I, uh, this human identity is relational. It comes about as the upshot of the encounter with the other and with oneself through the internal dialogue. On every occasion, to a certain extent, who I am depends on who my addressee is and on the purpose of interaction. The next, just about to finish. We, the next one, I want to skip everything. Uh, uh, this, okay, I will skip also. Okay, this is uh, a little description of what you saw. One woman asked to return to the stage so as to present a better version of herself, what you saw. What transpires on the second occasion when she comes on the stage may be used as evidence of the continuity, cynicism, between this person in and out of the filmed realm. The next one. Okay, this is a bit complex. I will probably skip it, but is using the dichotomy between dynamical object and immediate object, right? What brings her there is uh, what she thinks she's going to be on the stage the second time, a happy-go-lucky woman laughing and singing a song, but she ignores, this is the whole idea of the unconscious, she ignores that the dynamical object truly is the grief that comes out. And so the immediate object is that part of the huge object, which is the thing, right, what we are about really, that comes out in every sign action. And that can always be wrong. That can always misrepresent. So what the sign represents can do it correctly or as Sarita mistakenly. She thinks she will be funny, she will laugh, she ends up crying. Next. In our lives, I think we all behave like Sarita, the tearful woman on the stage. The director who talks to her, the film viewers, we're always traveling on a path that leads us fallibly to the truth somehow. And in that consists the powerful epiphany that we are offering Joe of the Sena, the documentary whose fragment I showed you. Its aesthetic gift is the discovery, or rather the self-discovery of the real nature of the grief of Sarita, of our own grief. Thank you very much for your patience. I hope something came across. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Andash was a brilliant presentation. Thank you so much, really. So now I would like to invite Dr. Luis de Miranda to share his uh, commentary and his thought with us. But first, let me introduce him. So Dr. Luis de Miranda lives near Stockholm, Sweden, and he's a philosophical practitioner trained in applied continental philosophy, the history of ideas, and psychoanalysis, who came to academia after a career as an independent author and publisher in Paris. He is a researcher at Uppsala University, where he currently works on the theory and practice of philosophical health at the Center for Medical Humanities. His PhD from University of Edinburgh is a modern analogy of the concept of the spirit, the corpse, and was the groundwork for his book, Ensemblance, sorry for my pronunciation again, Ensemblance. In his research strategies, he tends to combine historical, empirical, and speculative approaches, such as in his essay, Being and Neon, Neonness, Neonness. So Dr. Luis de Miranda, welcome. Thank you. It's good to see you all. And, um, and of course, thank you, Professor Andact, for this thought provoking talk. And uh, you mentioned Prometheus. 
As a matter of fact, uh, I do live in Sweden, but I am right now, as uh, we speak, at the very foot of Mount Olympus in a small village called Litohoro in Greece. And I was uh, thinking about your sentence, your question, the, um, the daily question, a dead child uh, is not really dead. For the parents, one could say. So, uh, what, what is a dead child for the parents? And I was thinking about dead languages. Uh, in what sense, since I'm in Greece, it, in what sense is Plato still meaningful if his language is dead? In what sense is Mount Olympus still the home of gods while it is today a place of uh, tourism and uh, uh, scientists would say prosaically uh, just mountains with no beyond. That's why perhaps I haven't, uh, it's too warm for that too, but I haven't uh, hiked uh, the mountain because somehow I know that I might not find anything. And the Greek gods were tragic comic, right? They, they were both high and low. They were both at the very contact with matter and meaning, which is what strikes when we see the mountain. It's like it's, it's really mixing with the sky. There is a continuity between the uh, the earth and and uh, and spirit in this place and in your documentary extract which is uh very touching uh, uh, because it's also my mother tongue so I, I i could understand the subtlety of it well i would also argue that there is an element of tragic comic because, as you uh, mentioned very well, she comes and says, I'm going to be comic. I don't want to be tragic. And she ends up being tragic. But because she said she wanted to be comic, in fact, she's tragic comic. So she, she is also comic. And I would argue that, and I, again, I speak from a position at the foot of, Mount, of the Mount Olympus of semiotics, uh, being uh, a neophyte, but I would argue that meaning and sign also have a tragic comic relationship. And that is what you have been talking about. For example, when you talked about the difference between play and aggression in, uh, in uh, uh, animals, for example, or even in our exchange today what is serious what is not serious and one of the things i take from your very um uh true uh, inescapably true intervention is that truth is inescapable and that's tragic comic so meaning and sign have a tragic comic relation uh, a slippery one and um, despite the fact that you speak of non-dualism, I wonder here if there is not a tension. Uh, and that would be perhaps my first uh, question or the sign of a question. Uh, in the sense that, and you did mention a daily quote where he, he seems to say that meaning is metabiological, metamaterial. And of course, there's a relation there. But still, uh, if I speak to you in Greek and if I say, uh, if I say Plato is the father of the theory of forms, and if I say, Platon est le père de la théorie des formes, or if I say 
it in Portuguese, etc. It will have the same meaning, but different traces. So there is a detachment there that I'm curious about. A detachment in the sense of something that is detached from uh, the, 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 the material trace, somehow. I understood that um, you wanted to position yourself um, in contradistinction with this idea of per perspectivism in which uh, uh, we are um, a bit Protagorean, we are the creators of meaning in the world. And to some extent, I sympathize with the intention, but I will try to problematize it um, in what follows by questioning more than answering. So, for example, you insisted on reaction, uh, the reaction of the real as sort of pr primo mobile rather than creation. And that's bold because, as you said of, of Pierce in the 19th century, it's bold because we, we emerge out of a, um, a century that has repeated in many ways that creation is the primo mobile. And so, despite the title, which is the creative treatment of actuality, what I heard is that, in fact, it's a reactive treatment, but not a reactive treatment in the sense that uh, it would be fabricated or faked, to use your quote from James. But rather, what is more uh, traditionally thought of in psychoanalysis, at least, uh, and in, uh, in particular in Lacan, as this unconscious production of reality. Truth, as uh, in Lacan's real, as being there uh, no matter what. So let's go back to the dead child then. Uh, he is not real in a way because it's dead, but of course he has meaning for the parents, even when dead and perhaps even more so. Ghosts being more present in a way than um, real living beings and what you say about the person is a little bit the idea that our ghosts the ghosts that we uh, project uh, speak more than our attempt to uh, have a desperate place our desperate attempt to have uh, a place and we'll come back to that with the idea of character. And I'll, I won't be much long. Um, give me just one minute. And so I was thinking about your anecdote of the encounter with Dili. And if I understood correctly, this is how I received it. Um, at two o'clock in the morning, you took, you had a few drinks, you were at the bar and he came up with his huge manuscript and you said, I think it was um, uh, his, his book on the history of philosophy uh, uh, through biosemiotics. But this, I think, made me think, OK, maybe you don't know what the manuscript was about. And that manuscript stands for the place of the real. And it's polysemy.
And at the same time, this is what I see when you speak of the person in the documentary and outside. There is a polysemy of the person, which resonates to my practice. I'm a philosophical counselor and, and uh, I, I work, for example, in the clinical context where I, I, I try to produce, to co-produce with the person, right? We speak of person-centered care, her sense of purpose, her philosophy of life, uh, out of the polysemy of her um, history, but also of the possibilities of reaction to a trauma, for example, a spinal cord injury. So where I uh, question, and I'll finish with this, um, where I question what you propose is that I do believe that we create meaning all the time. Now, that does not mean that we control it. However, while I do think that there is a continuity in uh, beings in their bodily sense, sense of self, sense of belonging, and sense of the possible, which I think we share with, with all beings. I do believe that the matter of the sense of purpose is a human story. I do not think that we can say that the little creature has mine in the sense that the creature has a sense of purpose. However, I would agree that the sense of the possible is a proto-mind. So, I do think it is the human tragicomic destiny to, to be the, the locus of the sense of purpose and the philosophical sense. And coming back to ancient Greece, and this is where I will conclude. In Greek, in ancient Greek, this dead language that it, is still speaking to us. The character is a stem. The character is this ideal of standing for something, standing for a philosophical stance, uh, for a concept, for an idea, which of course we constantly miss because as you have very rightly said, uh, the real is slippery. And this is where I will end, is in this final question in the form of a provocation, would you leave the question of meaning to the unconscious or would you agree that it is our responsibility, even if we know that is a never-ending story and that uh, truth cannot be framed? Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Luis Miranda, for such a thought-provoking <laughs> response, which I, I'm sure I will not be able to answer, but let me begin by the beginning. Uh, the tragic comic, I most definitely, I most definitely agree. I, I very much like what you said. Uh, she said, mas para o trágico que para o cómico. The woman said at the beginning, right? This is the meta-communication about which Bateson and I think Peirce would call it habit, right? It is, she always gets away. She's a force of nature. So uh, the only thing is she's ignorant about is her unconscious. She doesn't perceive that there is this grief, enormous grief about which she talked the first time. Remember, she's the only woman. It, it takes a lot of courage, I think, to ask for a second time. I will never climb on that stage. I will never do that, right? 
I, I love documentaries, but I wouldn't submit myself to that. And and uh, she comes very, uh, her mind is set, okay, uh, with this idea that now she will turn table, she will turn the table, she will show her best self, the best she can. And the best she can is a person full of life, full of vitality. And I couldn't agree with you more, Professor de Miranda, that she ends up being both tragic and comic because she sings this amazingly beautiful Portuguese um, lullaby. Lullaby, right? It's, it's very ancient. I, I checked it after I saw it the first time. Is this is this a tra it's a traditional Portuguese lullaby, right? I learned the word ninar. This is the beautiful thing. I lived in Brazil for five years, and I, you learn the the words as you go, right? I had learned my academic Portuguese, but my everyday Portuguese was always deficient. So ninar, I didn't have. I thought it was a beautiful word, which has nothing to do with English lullaby or with the Spanish Cancion de Cuna. It's completely different. So that is also uh, something you mentioned very nicely about this uh, detachment. There is always a detachment, yes, because I appreciate the Portuguese as a fine wine, as the Porto wine, for example, which I tried in Portugal when I went. Uh, it's something I never drink. For me, it's forever associated with my visit to this vineyard in, Port in Lisbon. And um, I, when, when she says uh, barra pesada, I love it because there is no translation. You have to know Portuguese. Barra pesada is not heavy. It's, it's, it's untranslatable. Every, every good sign is untranslatable. And I like the way you put it, this uh, detachment. I feel myself as an enjoyer, right, of the language, of the signs, not, on, not only of this marvelous epiphany, when she says, como vou cantar chorando. This is a, a tragic comic moment. She, she covers, this is a universal gesture. I've checked it in many documentaries. When somebody breaks down, they do this as to stop the tears. Nothing brings more tears than this, right? You try to stop yourself from crying, but that's indexicality, that's a reaction. You cannot control your blushing. You cannot control your tears. You can fake them if you're very good, if you're an actor, but control them. And uh, when you were speaking of the mountains of, of Greece and of Plato, I was thinking of Auerbach, of my missus, right? When he compares the episode of the ancient testament of Abraham going to sacrifice his only son Isaac, and uh, a chapter from the from the Odyssey uh, when uh, Odysseus Ulysses returns to Ithaca, and uh, that gives you a flavor of Judeo-Christian uh, sort of populistic culture, as uh, a critic says, and on the other hand, the aristocratic culture of of Greek epic, right? Because it's Euryclea, a servant who recognizes Ulysses, who says, my master, hmm? and he keeps her quiet so he doesn't die. And um, I, I I will skip because he was very rich, right? Uh, uh, Lacan, you mentioned Lacan. You know that Lacan received a manuscript translation by George uh, uh, Deledal, it's not George, okay. Uh, Deledal is a French philosopher who introduced Peirce to uh, intellectual environment in the 70s in France. And he took the manuscript to Jacques Lacan, whose uh, the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic is heavily influenced, as he says in a, in a very uh, not very well known article. He says, I'm reading somebody whose name I will not tell you. The name is Peirce. Uh, that is behind this diagram, the famous you know, interlocking circles of real and imaginary. And I, uh, I, what you told me was very, very uh, stimulating, brought to mind a Greek French philosopher, I'm sure you know, uh, Cornelius Castoriadis. He proposes the idea of the radical imaginary and the historic imaginary or established, institutionalized. I think that uh, our creativity, do we make meaning or do we navigate meaning? I'm, I'm, I'm more for the second, right? Uh, I think we navigate meaning. Mm, making meaning uh, gives uh, a picture that I think is not appropriate because when we are born, we are already swimming in meaning. You were born in Portugal, I was born in Uruguay, right? And I was swimming in, in things that I have lived in many countries. I have lived in Canada, in Norway, in Germany, um, in Brazil. And in, in every place, 
uh, I, I have felt both uh, belonging to and a foreigner, right? Because I cannot fake. I, uh, uh, I, I, there are Portuguese expressions, right? Uh, there is a negative which I have never been able to use. I understand it, uh, which means right. And um, right now it doesn't come to my mind, but uh, it shows I'm a non-native speaker. And, and that uh, I think is uh, part of uh, the non-creation of meaning. It's more that we are the squatters of meaning. We put ourselves uh, and the creativity that we have. Uh, I give you an example. After the uh, fascinating documentary called Edificio Master of this Copacabana building of middle, lower middle class, uh, Globo, which is a very important uh, uh, company of media in Brazil, went there because it was a rather popular, you know, documentaries are never popular. They are uh, a kind of acquired taste. Um, uh, they went and they interviewed some of the people of the building and it was horrible. It was something sad and depressing and, and had nothing to do with the documentary. That's the creativity. That is the spontaneity, which first calls it firstness. It's uh, firstness or thirdness. He says mentality. There is something so spontaneous in the questions, in the comments that Coutinho makes to the addressee that bring about, you see, uh, this explosion, this encounter between two persons that I've never met before. And as he says, the director, I will never meet again, but the least I can do is not harm the other person, not make the other person seem ridiculous or stupid. And I think uh, it's the contrary. He, he manages something close to the psychoanalytic situation somehow without being a psychoanalyst or anything because he, he brings this unconscious. I think that there is something uh, in what you said, right? Uh, the unconscious production of reality. Uh, I think I mentioned this, this uh, or if I didn't, uh, in, in the following documentary, which is, I think, inspired by this ending, this encounter with Sarita, it's all people who have to sing a song. The only requirement is that they sing in tune so they don't make a clown of themselves. And there is this uh, middle-class man who is, I think, an engineer with glasses, sits very correctly, and he sings a beautiful song. His mother was a dressmaker for brides, okay, for the wedding uh, dress. And after he sings it beautifully, he cannot stop crying, not like Sarita, crying all the way, he can't stop. And he, when he stops, he says something beautiful. He says, I don't know why I cried. My mother is well and alive and healthy. I have the best relationship with her. And that's the secret, I think, of the unconscious. You see, the, the film, the encounter, made him reveal something that was unknown to him. He didn't know why he was crying like that, okay? The mother was alive. They were in a loving mother and son relationship but he had this very deep sorrow. Who knows why? Doesn't matter. Uh, because obviously the documentary shows a passing epiphany, just a moment. But I think what it reveals is something tragicomic, as you so nicely said, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, and uh, I think of Vincent Colapietro, a marvelous Persian philosopher who was in the seminar not long ago, in his book, which I so strongly recommend to everyone, Peirce's Approach to the Self, he gathers all the references of Peirce to the self, the identity. He says that every death is tragic because human beings always have an unfinished narrative, an unfinished story. Wherever death catches us, there's always something, some more signs to come. You see, nobody can say I have lived fully all my personal uh, possibilities. You mentioned possibility many times, and that for Percy's is firstness, is creativity, is the spontaneity, is from where art, but not just art like Picasso, like Machado de Assis or Shakespeare, uh, art in the sense of making of our life an art form saying things that change other people's lives that are good, right? Like a good psychologist or a good teacher uh, makes an experience that is unforgettable, that is memorable. And so I will end here, I don't want to go, but I love the way you said it, the real is slippery. I couldn't agree more. The real is that road, okay? That fallible road that we have to follow. And the only thing we can hope is not to block the road of inquiry. 
I think that documentaries, paradoxically enough, uh, do the contrary of blocking the road of inquiry. Even though what they said they have done, I couldn't disagree more. I think that they reveal some marvelous aspects of the real, not a fiction, not a fiction. If everything is a fiction, nothing is a fiction. I think that human beings are capable of amazing things as Sarita is, uh, leaves us with this tragic comic, as you so rightly said, mixture of tears and beautiful lullaby. And we hear in the background Marilia Pera, the actress who doesn't appear like the first time. The first time it's a, it's a back and forth between the actress and Sarita. But this time we only hear her singing Si esa rua, si esa rua, fosse mia, the lullaby. So thank you very much for your thoughtful comments. I really like them and I think they, they make my, my approach more interesting than what I thought it could be. Thank you very much. Yes, so I will, I will not add anything. I, I also thank you and I would prefer now to uh, let other people ask questions or comments. Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Andash and Dr. Miranda. We will close the broadcasting on YouTube now but of course we will open the floor to the audience present here. But it was a brilliant presentation, a brilliant discussion. Thank you so much. And the floor is open now.